Let me say a few things before I take your questions. As you know, the special counsel released this finding today about their look into my handling of classified documents. <clears throat> I was pleased to see he reached a firm conclusion that no charges should be brought against me in this case. This was an exhaustive investigation going back more than 40 years, even into the 1970s when I was still a new United States senator. <clears throat> the special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give the special counsel what he needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person, five-hour in-person interview over two days on October the 8th and 9th of last year, even though Israel had just been attacked by Hamas on the 7th, and I was very occupied. It was in the middle of handling an international crisis. I was especially pleased to see special counsel make clear the stark distinction and difference between this case and Mr. Trump's case. The special counsel wrote, and I quote, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear, continuing to quote, most notably, after giving multiple chances to return classified documents to avoid prosecution, Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for many months, he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. In contrast, he went on to say Mr. Biden turned in classified documents to the National Archives and the Department of Justice, consented to the search of multiple locations, including his home, sat for a voluntary interview, and in other ways cooperated with the investigation, end of quote. I've seen the headlines since the report was released about my willful retention of documents. This, these assertions are not only misleading, they're just plain wrong. On page 215, if you had a chance, I know it's a long, it's a thick document. On page 215, in the report of the special counsel found the exact opposite. Here's what he wrote. There is, in fact, a shortage of evidence that I willfully retain classified materials related to Afghanistan. On page 12, the special counsel also wrote for another documents, the decision to decline criminal charges was straightforward. The evidence suggests that Mr. Biden did not willfully retain these documents. The evidence said I did not willfully retain these documents. In addition, I know there's some attention paid to some language in the report about my recollection of events. There's even reference that I don't remember when my son died. How in the hell dare he raise that? Frankly, when I was asked the question, I thought to myself, it wasn't any of their damn business. Let me tell you something. Some of you have commented, I wear, since the day he died, every single day, the rosary he got from Our Lady of... Every Memorial Day, we hold a service remembering him, attending by friends and family and the people who loved him. I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away or he passed away. Simple truth is, I sat for a five-hour interview over two days of events going back 40 years. At the same time I was managing an international crisis, their task was to make a decision about whether to move forward with charges in this case. That's their decision to make. That's the council's decision to make. That's his job. And they decided not to move forward. For any extraneous commentary, they don't know what they're talking about. It has no place in this report. The bottom line is the matter is now closed. I'm going to continue what I've always focused on, my job of being President of the United States of America. Now, thank you, and I'll take some questions. President Biden, something the special counsel said in his report is that one of the reasons you were not charged is because, in his description, you are a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. It's How totally bad is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I let you speak. That's, you, uh, that's, you that's my your memory. memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, president? look, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? 
You know, I guess I just forgot what was going on. Mr. President, Mr. President. Do voters have concerns about your age? How are you going to assuage them? And do you fear that this report is only going to fuel further concerns about your age? Only by some of you. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President you want to clear up criminal Mr. liability Mr. President, today, Mr. President. Do you take responsibility for at least being careless with classified material? I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. As it goes in and points out, things that appeared in my garage, things that came out of my home, things that were moved, were moved not by me, but my staff, but my staff. Mr. President, 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 Mr.
humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. I talked to Bibi to open the gate on the Israeli side. I've been pushing really hard, really hard, to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza. There are a lot of innocent people who are starving, a lot of innocent people who are in trouble and dying. And it's got to stop, number one. Number two, I was also in a position that I'm the guy that made the case that we have to do much more to increase the amount of material going in, including fuel, including other items. I've been on the phone with the Qataris, I've been on the phone with the Egyptians, I've been on the phone with the Saudis to get as much aid as we possibly can into Gaza. There are innocent people, innocent women and children who are also in bad, badly in need of help. And so that's what we're pushing. And I'm pushing very hard now to deal with this hostage ceasefire because, as a, you know, I've been working tirelessly in this deal. How can I say this without revealing it? To lead to a sustained pause in the fighting, in the actions taking place in, in the Gaza Strip. And uh, because I think if we can get the delay for that, uh, the initial delay, I think that uh, we would be able to uh, extend that uh, so that we could increase the prospect that this fighting in Gaza changes. There's also negotiations. You may recall, in the very beginning, right after, right before Hamas attacked, I was in contact with the Saudis and others to work out a deal where they would recognize Israel's right to exist, let them make them part of the Middle East, recognize them fully in return for certain things that the United States would commit to do. And the commitment to, that we were proposed to do related to two, uh, two, two items, I'm not going to go in detail, but one of them was to deal with uh, um, the protection against their arch enemy to the northwest, the northeast, I should say. The second one, by providing ammunition and material for them to defend themselves. Coincidentally, that's the time frame when this broke out. I have no proof what I'm about to say, but it's not unreasonable to suspect that the Hamas understood what was about to take place and wanted to break it up before it happened. Mr. 